welcome to Strix PLC, first of all. Uh, in the next 30 minutes or so, I'm going to take you on a flying tour of Strix and show you just how exciting kettles in water can be. Um, quite a lot to go through, uh, and I do want to make sure we leave time for some questions at the end. So I'm going to run through the presentation fairly quickly, so, so brace yourself uh, and we'll get started. So if we can move on to the, uh, the timeline slide, first of all, just to give you a little bit of history uh, about the company, first of all. So our roots date back to 1950, in fact, where Eric Taylor started Castletown Thermostats based here on the Isle of Man. Um, the core technology was invented during the Second World War and, and used in uh, flying suits. So effectively, pilots were trying to get higher and higher altitudes to get that technical advantage. Unfortunately, it got very cold and there was a risk then of passing out, which clearly isn't great when you're flying an aeroplane. So they came up with these, these special suits with heaters inside and they used resistors to effectively switch on the, the heaters. And unfortunately, as the resistors started to work, they started generating electrical noise and they interfered with the communications and with the panels on the aeroplane, which again, doesn't really help when you're flying a fighter, pl fighter plane. So Eric Taylor came up with what was a bimetallic blade and it's actually called a snap action blade. And this is a, a little bit like a contact lens in, in shape. And when it gets to a very specific temperature, it effectively just inverts. And that gives you enough force to use a mechanical switch to switch things on and off. Uh, and the rest, as they say, is history with the technology. And that actually today is still used in just about all of the kettles around the world. Uh, and it's keeping consumers safe when anything happens inside the kettle. Perhaps you forget to put water in or there's any fault in that. It will switch off safely. So in the early 1980s, there was a, a rift within the family. And John Taylor, his son, actually set up Strix and vowed to become the market leader. Frankly, he's done a really great job as we now hold around 55% value share globally and are nearly four times larger than our nearest competitor. In fact, um, around 70% of you on this call are using a Strix product every day. You probably don't realize that, but thank you very much. And we estimate Strix controls are used more than 1.2 billion times per day by consumers in more than 100 countries and by over 10% of the world's population. So it's a pretty impressive statistics. Um, in 2005, the business was sold to private equity, uh, who held the business actually through until August 2017, when we successfully listed on AIM, buying them out 100%. And frankly, that listing was probably the best thing that's happened in Strix during the history. And in that three year period, we've grown the share price from the pound, which was the listing price, up to around £2.90, with some really significant opportunities that I'm sure you'll see as we go through this presentation. Uh, and also highlighted in, in our recent Capital Markets Day, which you can see on our, on our website as well. I mean, frankly, Strix was a bit of a hidden gem. Uh, and from an investment proposition, it offers um, a really good deal. It is a, an extremely robust and resilient business, demonstrated up by our performance through the pandemic. We have manufacturing in China, Italy, and on the Isle of Man, all of which have remained operational throughout the pandemic, other than a, a short three-week shutdown in China. We have a very strong focus on costs and continuous improvements embedded within our culture, as you'll see. Um, extremely cash generative, typically with a cash to EBITDA ratio of greater than 70% and very profitable. Uh, and we have an attractive progressive dividend policy linked to our underlying earnings, which with our growth plans will remain attractive. And the board is committed to delivering that as we did through the pandemic. We operate in growth markets with plenty of opportunity, as you'll see. And if that's not enough, we also have an excellent ESG position with products that save energy, re remove viruses and bacteria from water, and reduce the amount of single-use plastics. So with that, maybe we can move on to the highlight slide. Uh, next one on, if we could, thank you. So for many, 2020 was a, a really uh, challenging period, but frankly, for Strix, it, was, it has been a, a real pivotal year. You're building a strong foundation as we continue to transform our business with a number of key strategic initiatives that will support our midterm growth objectives. In the first half, we saw our core business, the cattle side, hit with China moving into lockdown first during the Chinese New Year. And then you had the disruption of local sales and the supply chains going on. And then obviously you were quickly followed by more global lockdowns and a further dip in demand for the cattle business. However, thanks to the work of the team here, we responded very, very swiftly. And actually from May onwards, um, we saw a significant rebound, really showing the resilience of the business. And for the remainder of the year, every month, pretty much every month was a record month for Strix. Uh, as I'm very pleased to, to report that we continue to show that strength going into 2021. And I'm sure a big part of that is all of you working from home, drinking extra tea and coffee, um, wearing out some of those appliances. So yes, yeah, certainly the regulated markets have been very strong for us. 
We also saw a very positive position in our filtration and appliance categories, both of which demonstrated growth throughout the year, despite the, the, the global um, disruptions. So the overall outcome for us was a strong financial control, sorry, with our strong financial controls in place, was that despite a slight decline in revenue, we were able to post a 3% increase in our year over year EBITDA uh, and continue to invest in what we think are the key strategic initiatives through that period. Given the confidence and the liquidity of the business, we have been able to commit firmly to our stated progressive dividend linked to the underlying earnings with an increase to 7.85 pence per share, uh, which was in line with our policy. So from an operational perspective, you know, we have continued to implement automation of our assembly lines. Uh, we can now make a control on our lines every 1.8 seconds. Bear in mind, if you go back five or six years ago, that was every eight or 10 seconds. So significant changes in the technology being used. We also successfully implemented SAP into the business, improving our real-time data and streamlining our internal processes. We were very proud to win awards with two of our key OEMs in China for best cooperation and most outstanding contributor. I think that really demonstrates our position within the value chain supporting our customers. We've also been very busy, busy with our strategic initiatives. Uh, we successfully acquired a company called Leica. Not an easy task with all the tra travel restrictions and lockdowns, and this is already proving to be an, an excellent addition to the group. And we're really excited about the progress of our new factory in China, which remains on track and on budget. During the period, we also took the opportunity to strengthen our management, our engineering and our marketing teams to really um, support our growth ambitions over the sort of next three to five years. And we have successfully de developed a record number of new products and technologies in a wide range of markets and grown our share in our core market. So if we move on to the next slide, just looking at some of the progress of those medium term targets. All of those initiatives have supported that medium term, which was communicated back in the November's Capital Markets Day, which is to double the size of our business, primarily through organic growth within the next five years. Clearly, we wouldn't have come to the market if we weren't confident to achieve that. And we believe we built the foundations to do that over the course of the last two to three years since we listed back in 2017. So let's just take a quick look at the progress we've made in some of those areas. Uh, we've grown our, our market share in our core market and acquired Leica to enhance both the appliance and water categories, both of which are growth markets. Based on the positive recovery last year, the acquisition of Leica and a strong start to this year, we are definitely set to achieve uh, in excess of a 30% revenue growth in 2021, which we really think demonstrates our ability to grow the business and well on our way to our five-year target. We've implemented um, a sustainability strategy with the dedicated project teams in this, inside the company and an ESG committee has been set up led by the board um, by Richard Sells, actually one of our new NEDs. And given our resilient performance and confidence in the outlook, we've also executed our progressive dividend policy, as I said, increasing the dividend to that 7.85 pence per share in line with earnings. All of that has been done during the pandemic where we've successfully managed costs whilst continuing to prudently invest in what we think are the key strategic initiatives. Some of you um, who, who looked at the company back in 2017 uh, may remember I expressed a bit of frustration that we had not been able to realise you know, our full potential under the previous ownership. And I hope now and during the course of this presentation, you will see that we are well on the path to do just that. We are going to emerge from the pandemic much stronger as a result of the investments made this year. Uh, we are going to realise our potential with a business set to deliver growth, with an enviable market position, an attractive dividend, and an excellent ESG proposition. So with that, let's just move into the um, financial highlights quickly. So first of all, on the revenue side, we saw a slight um, drop in revenue, 1.6% uh, versus the, the reported. Um, solid results despite the pandemic and certainly above um, our anticipated numbers at the beginning of the year. Um, absolute gross profit held relatively fat, flat versus the prior year but the gross profit margin actually increased by 50 basis points to 41.4%. And that really was supported by a strong product mix, operational efficiencies, as well as the addition of Leica at the very back end of last year. Adjusted EBITDA increased by 3.2%, with the adjusted EBITDA margin improving by 1.8 points. This does really reflect the highly flexible variable cost base that we have, along with our continued improvements of operations and I think it does demonstrate the true resilience of this business you know, in some of those difficult times. 
Um, adjusted profit before tax reported a 2.4% increase at 30.9 million, which again was well ahead of our capital market state projection. Uh, net debt reported at 32.7 million, uh, an increase of around 10.9 million, largely due, uh, largely to fund that acquisition of Leica. And as we've reported, yeah, we actually increased our, our dividend by 2%. So we have a final dividend of 5.25 pence um, being proposed, totaling 7.85. So if we can move on to the um, profit and loss slide. Thank you. So revenue declined, as I say, by the 1.6%, but supported by that additional um, uh, two months of the Leica. But overall, the water category grew by 20%, and the appliance category almost tripled, actually, albeit from quite a low base. Um, cattle controls, you know, still 85% of our revenue. That declined over the prior year due entirely to the, the sort of the start of the year, particularly the first four months, where we actually saw a decrease of 24%. Um, however, um, we saw that bounce back come back very quickly. So for the full year, actually, the reduction in the cattle side was just 7%. Um, so very, very strong recovery in the second half, which I say continued into 2021. From an operating cost point of view, before exceptionals were reduced by 2% versus last year, the group has leveraged on the opportunity to reorganize our resource pool to really align to our strategic initiatives. This continued to show our strength to really manage the costs under a challenging pandemic environment while supporting that top line growth. Um, looking at the exceptional costs for the year, they were primarily acquisition related costs of 2.5 million. We've also booked um, share-based payment costs of around 1.9 million substantially below the prior year of, of 6 million, um, which was the original um, sort of share allocation at the listing point. Adjusted profit after tax increased, increased by 2.3%, which again beat our capital markets day guidance. And then just looking at tax, um, we actually changed our tax process in China uh, back in 2019 to be an import processing license, which is a form that is much more accepted by the local governments in China. And that gave us a, a, a sort of blended tax rate, a stabilized blended ta rate, tax rate of about 4.5%. Uh, with the addition of Leica, we will see a, a slight increase because the Italian tax rate is around 28%. So the guidance we're giving at the moment is around 6.5%. If you look over the full five year period, it may get to seven, seven and a half percent as we grow in, in China and Italy. Um, Isle of Man operation remained at 0% corporate tax rate. So if we can move on to the, the cash flow slide, thank you. This is um, a net debt waterfall slide that really tries to show the major movements of cash and debts in the business. Uh, with the acquisition, we have renewed and expanded our, our RCF facility to 80 million pounds using three banks, but we managed to achieve the same competitive rates that we had previously, and that's now been extended for the next five years, giving us plenty of headroom. Um, our net working capital requirement remained relatively low and stable, there was a 500k of outflow before the addition of Leica. Um, Leica itself added around 1.2 million of outflow to a total of 1.7 million. Um, as we did communicate in the capital markets day, there is substantial room for improvement in Leica supply chain. Um, it was a, a, a family owned business and we are looking now to work with all of the functions to integrate Leica. And yeah, we will see a, a gradual improvement over the coming months, particularly of the, sort of the cash flows within that business. We've recruited already um, a new GM and a finance director who are very, very focused with our finance team over here to improve you know, the working capital and the cash flow. Exceptional costs were, were largely acquisition related and were offset mostly by the proceeds of warrants exercised by Zeus. Uh, those warrants have, have all now been exercised, so none of those left it to, to, to run. And from CapEx, it you know, largely pertained to the factory construction with a £9 million spend last year. Uh, remainder of the operating cash was approximately 6% of sales. We did slow the capex down on automation in the first half of the year just to match the sales forecast and to preserve cash, but resume back to our normal spend in the second half. Um, so far, 67% of all of our assembly lines are now fully automated, and we would expect this to go to around 73% by the end of this year with a new factory online. I'm also happy to say that we implemented the ERP SAP system successfully. Um, during Q4, without any of the major roadblocks, we closed the year under that new system. Uh, and our current plan is to roll out a new CRM system integrated to that SAP during the course of this year. The acquisition itself of Leica was funded by 10 million or 10.1 million pounds worth of cash and around 7.3 million of equity. Uh, and we had a, an OCF conversion to EBITDA of 45% for 
But if you take away the factory uh, capex and the acquisition cost, it would have been 73%, which is in line with the normal strict business model. So we'll start to see that return back to those 70% plus um, after this year when we've paid off all of the remaining parts of the, of the factory itself. So I can move on to the net debt slide. Um, net debt increased by around 11 million from prior year, which includes all of the borrowings, but not any of the deferred considerations on LICA or the IFRS uh, 16 leases. The reason for those exclusions was that the contribution from LICA was just 200K for the year, and we only had two months effectively of LICA on our books, and that didn't justify it to be included in the entire deferred considerations as a fair measure of net debt multiples. For reference, those, those maximum deferred considerations are 5.4 million pounds respectively for the years of um, 22 and 23 payouts. Uh, and the net debt to EBITDA multiple tracked at around one times, and it's projected to stay at about one time during the course of this year end, um, as those deferred considerations are expected to be self-financed. Um, total liquidity pool tracked at about 42 million at year end, uh, so we have plenty of headroom to meet the uh, peak network and capital draw of 6 million at any time of throughout the year. So if we can now move on to the capital allocation slide. You can see the group has four core capital allocation priorities. During the year, we have prudently allocated funding to three of those capital pots. Um, capital for expanded operational and, and automation. And we had the acquisition, of course, and we had the progressive dividend. We did not pay down any loans last year, but we will continue to deleverage with any excess cash that we have. We have a very flexible revolving facility that allows us to draw down within 24 hours notice. So it makes sense to use any of that excess cash to pay that down and, and get lower interest rates. So if we can just run on to the, uh, the next slide, looking at the factory. Uh, we embarked on, on the land and factory acquisition project in late 2019, and since then it has progressed extremely well, both on time and on budget, despite all of the disruptions that we've had uh, over that pandemic period. The factory is looking absolutely amazing. We did have a short video actually, but it's about a month old now. And to be honest, it, it really doesn't do it justice. Uh, we've started moving everything over to the new factory already. Um, and we will definitely be uh, completed on time uh, August of this year with it fully operational. The new location of the factory uh, is in the same Guangdong province as our current site. It's just actually 22 kilometers away. Uh, and it's about one to three hours in the radius of all of our customer base. So very, very convenient for our operation over there. Um, the factory itself is more than double our current capacity in China, but has the same operating costs. And we will execute additional insourcing opportunities in that new factory pretty much from day one, particularly within the, the water category. So we'll start to see some improvements in the gross margin of those as we pull in those insourcing opportunities. Um, the factory construction itself was completed in January. Um, and as I say, we've already started moving things over. About 35% of the production lines are now in place and already up and running. Um, we are going to do some prudent um, stock building over the course of, of the next three or four months, uh, but we anticipate burning that all off by the end of the year. So for the full year, there should really be no um, adverse effect on stock um, as a result of that new factory. We're also investing in renewable energy. So uh, by the time it opens in August, all of the assembly lines will be run, run by solar power. And we've also invested in uh, new facilities for the dormitories as well to make sure we're looking after the welfare of the workers um, nearer the new factory. The last investment will be £5 million, which will be incurred this year. Uh, so total budget for the factory is £20 million, which was the original budget we put in place. So if we can move on to the, uh, the next slide, which we're just going to go through the categories in a little bit more detail um, to give you a bit more um, uh, updated information on the three various categories in the business, starting with the, the kettles, which obviously is, is our core business and today represents around 85% of our revenues. So the, the cattle global market ended the year, year broadly flat in volume terms um, with positive growth in terms of the regulated markets and the less regulated markets, offsetting a little bit of weakness in the China market. For Strix, we saw an increase in value share uh, with growth, particularly in our key regulated territories of the UK, America and Australia, as well as very strong growth within the less regulated markets driven by latest new controls that we've developed positioned to be more competitive. Um, this more than offset what was a slight weakness in China, where Strix actually is more present in the physical stores because they tend to be the, the higher priced appliances, 
people like to go and sort of see and feel those appliances from the major brands. However, very pleased to say we've seen a very strong rebound in China at the beginning of this year, um, given the relaxation of those restrictions. So certainly um, post-March of this year, things are pretty much back to sort of pre-COVID levels in, in all three of those markets. And the OEMs themselves are reporting very good visibility at the moment. Uh, we hold a very strong order book, so we have very high confidence for the first half of this year already. Of course, there are headwinds. You've got commodity prices all over the place at the moment, um, foreign exchange rates, Brexit to a degree, although we're not really impacted so much by Brexit, frankly. Um, but we are confident we can offset any of those impacts through our disciplined approach in managing the efficiency measures and the commercial initiatives we have in place. Um, if commodities are continue to, to, to go um, higher and higher, uh, we would then put a price increase through to actually offset any risk to the full year. That's something we monitor um, on a constant basis. In fact, we are in the process of putting a, a, a price increase in at the moment, um, given the strength of silver, copper and plastics. Um, so certainly we, we should not expect to see any uh, disruption from those, those increased prices. Um, if we can move to the growth slide. Over the next five years in this category, we're looking to grow the segment around 3% CAGR. Uh, the market itself grows at about 2 to 3% CAGR, so it's very modest growth. We're looking to get a 3% gain in value share over the five year period. In fact, we've already got 1%. We started at 54, uh, we reported 55 at the beginning of this year. So that's been very successful. And that's really gonna be achieved through the evolution of our successful U9 series controls, which has already sold more than 33 million units since it's launched. So this really is business as usual as far as we're concerned. We're also gonna bring out some new variants for different geographies like the US and Japan, that run on different powers and also some different applications to expand our addressable market. We will continue to use innovation and technology to bring in the next generation of controls, which are really aimed at reducing the raw materials and driving the cost down to try again to get more incremental um, share of that business. But again, for us, that really is business as usual. It's something we've been doing for the last two to three decades. Uh, and I don't think that will change much. And um, just for information, we sometimes get asked about the growth of the, of the cattle market. Um, today, only 40% of households actually have an electric kettle, so still plenty of markets to get gain growth. And the key markets for us going forward at the moment certainly are America, where there's only 14% of households have an electric kettle. Um, certainly China, 40% penetration there. Um, India, where only about 12% penetration in households. Um, and Russia is also a very strong market with that, with that new range of controls as well. So plenty of opportunity for growth in, in what is our core business. If we go to the next slide, looking at the kettle control roadmap, one thing you'll see from this roadmap is the, the top left corner there. You can see the controls getting smaller and smaller. I mean, that's really important for us. I mean, we've done a lot of work in technology. Obviously, we are the market leader. Um, those small controls cannot be made manually. Um, so you have to have very, very high level of, of automation in your, in your factory to be able to produce them. Clearly, you can take out a lot of cost in doing that. So we really are moving the goalposts for our China competitors probably worth noting there's only two types of competitor in the cattle business. One is um, the original family um, company when it split, which is a UK based company. Um, and then all the other the, all the other competitors we have are China based copyists. So these um, improvements we're making in te technology make it harder and harder for people to follow us, really trying to push the goalposts out um, so we can you know, maintain or enhance that market lead position. Um, the other thing you'll find is uh, you know, a lot around sort of connectivity. Uh, you can actually now buy a kettle that says, or you can say to Alexa during half time, go and boil the water. Uh, and that, that's actually very easy to do on our kettles. But I think you'll see that come more in the applied sections uh, in a few minutes as well. So if we can move on to the, uh, the water category next. Um, this category is, is absolutely a key part of our growth over the next five to seven years. Um, it is, uh, We've, sorry, we've launched seven new products during the course of 2020 alone. Um, it, it is a huge opportunity and the, the addition of Leica is really gonna support our growth ambitions, enhancing our product offering and providing you know, a really exciting roadmap of new products and technologies, frankly, in a market where there is not much innovation today. And our aim is to be the clear number two player. I'm sure all of you have heard of Britta. So yeah, they're the number one player in the market by far. But yeah, definitely we are going to challenge um, that position to become the number two player in the market. If we can move to the, uh, the growth slide, um, looking at the five-year growth plans, we are driving for a CAGA of 27%, which at first time may seem a little bit high, but actually we consider this to be very realistic. In 2020, we had a growth of 20%. The market itself, uh, in, the, in the point of use area that we are at, 
grows at 15% CAGR, so half the growth actually comes from market growth. And with the addition of LICA, yeah, we have a really good kickstart to 2021. We now have a very strong portfolio of products. We've got very strong sales channels in the UK, Italy, um, America, and China. Um, America and China being significantly, that by far they're the largest growth markets in this segment. And we have a very strong roadmap of new products and technologies such that we can challenge the market leader. If we move on to the roadmap slide, um, you can see there's sort of four key elements to the roadmap slide. So first of all, you have the at-home range, a range of jugs and water stations to support various geographies. As an example, the chiller called Lumi is, is a really good example where we've experienced um, growth in excess of a thousand percent with return rates well below the industry standard for such electrical appliances. The on-the-go category, we have now an extensive range of bottles that we can now take to market ourselves rather than just relying on other brands. And Leica in particular brings some really great additions to the portfolio and being really well received by brands and retailers currently in Italy will soon to be rolled out to other areas like the UK, America and China as well. On the filter side, we have one of the most extensive range of filters, in fact, and we're removing metals, chemicals, plastics, viruses and bacteria. We also have some unique patented pour through filters, ideal for portable bottles. So you can literally put the filter, which is about the size for 50 pence piece in the top of a bottle and just drink it as though it wasn't there. Um, we also have a unique position of being able to offer a universal filter that will fit a wide range of competitor appliances. So we can fit, for instance, you know, a Brita appliance or any of our competitors' products, but it can't be done in reverse because we do have patents that prevent people actually using our interface into the Aqua Optima um, products at the moment. Um, the other section there is the commercial section. If you've been watching any of the um, RNSs in the last sort of six to 12 months, we have uh, acquired a technology for, from Halo Source called Halo Pure. Um, this is a really exciting technology in China. We now have two systems in place with two of the largest livestock companies in China. Um, it really is a significant opportunity with the China government looking to eliminate the use of antibiotics within that farming sector. We're looking to get another 10 systems in place this year, and we've established a network of distributors to really promote and support this opportunity. Um, it is quite a unique technology. The technology itself has been used for a number of years, very well patented. It's used for drinking water in China already by Halo Source. Um, so they're very, very safe with all the right approvals. But the, the key part in the farming industry, which is a much, much bigger market, is not only does it kill all the viruses and bacteria and remove the cysts from the water, but actually it leaves a residue in all the drinking troughs and so on. So it continues to kill that bacteria, even if, if after the water has been consumed, which is a unique um, feature uh, in, in that particular industry. So certainly we've got some good opportunities there. The uh, addressable market in China itself is 500 million pounds. Um, so huge opportunity. In our capital markets day, we only actually showed um, a, a, a figure of 10 million pounds uh, cumulative in five years. So clearly we're being quite conservative as we start to launch that, that new technology into that new market for us at least. Um, if we can then go to the appliance slide. So in this particular section, yeah, we, are, we doubled our sales in 2020, albeit from a low base. And for me, this is perhaps one of the most exciting categories. Um, as you can see, a um, huge opportunity again, we're just scratching the surface of this segment. The acquisition of Leica further our expand, expands our addressable market, moving us into food preparation and health and wellness, both of which have performed exceptionally well during the pandemic. Uh, we have several agreements in place now for our hot water on demand technology and for the baby care categories, providing a really good global footprint as we bring out you know, further products in, in this particular category. We can move to the, the growth slide. In this category, we're looking to triple the size of the, the category over the five years. So again, a very aggressive target, some would say, but we really do have an exciting roadmap of new products, both from within Strix, but also from the addition of Leica. The market itself already exists a double digit growth, and we're seeing excellent traction for some of our core technologies, such as the water stations. Um, routes to market here will be a combination of our own brands, as well as using many of our existing partners to maximize that opportunity and increase the speed to market. So in the kettles business today, we work with over 450 brands and retailers around the world. So we're leveraging on those relationships to bring these products into market as well. Um, if we can move to the, uh, the roadmap slide, uh, you can see some of the, sort of the, the new products in the, in the pictures here. Um, so I think some really good products bringing some real consumer benefits, both in terms of functionality, but also with benefits to the environment. So looking at the uh, hot water on demand as an example, 
One of the products you'll see in the market very soon is one called Aurora. That is effectively a water station that will provide you chilled, true boiled, and any temperature in between, no preheating of water. So these will deliver true boiling water in just five seconds. Um, and you can top it up as many times as you like. It's effectively like a small coffee machine on your work surface, um, but receiving very, very strong traction from the brands. Um, in the baby care section, we are expanding into sterilization systems with, again, some very strong patented technology that provides much more efficient operation and improved performance. And in the food preparation side, the addition of Leica brings things like sous vide cookers and vacuum pack systems, both of which, which actually grew significantly during the pandemic. Uh, and Leica certainly outperformed all the other brands in the Italian market um, during that period of time. So if we can move on to the uh, Leica slides. So we've talked a lot about Leica so far in this presentation. And for me, this is a really exceptional addition to our business. It really couldn't fit better, bringing a well-recognized and established brand, a real quality range of products for both the water and the appliance categories, a very strong and dedicated workforce, um, a state-of-the-art filter production site in Europe, um, which obviously with, with all the things going on with Brexit at the moment is very useful for us as well, and, and a really um, strong roadmap of new products to come through. During the pandemic, like Strix, you know, Leica was extremely resilient in both filters and appliances, particularly the food preparation, thermometers, and any of the other healthcare appliances, achieving double digit growth even through that the, the pandemic period. Um, integration for us is on track with each of the functions having a separate work stream and, and a very clear financial target for all of those so we can maintain the focus. We're in the process of restructuring the commercial groups to make sure we can establish combined distribution and brand lineups. And we've also started our first joint um, NPD product um, using the Leica brand. This will be um, a Strix development, um, very disruptive technology, bringing an induction kettle to the market uh, towards the end of this year. So certainly even, even looking to disrupt our, our own position. Um, and yet, again, a very, very strong passenger technology for that induction kettle. So if we can move to ESG, um, as discussed in the Cabin Markets Day recently, uh, Strix does have a really um, attractive ESG proposition, and we're working hard to bring that to life and really increase the communications to the wider market. Um, the environmental element has had quite a lot of press, and, and our products provide significant benefit, benefit by reducing energy, reducing single-use plastics, providing clean water and making products safer and with a, lo a longer lifespan. Uh, in addition to our products, we also have a very strong position within our operations, and are working to implement renewable energy in all of our assembly lines, reuse the wastewater um, during the testing process, as well as programs to reduce our overall carbon footprint. Um, later this year, following the opening of the factory, we will set out very clear KPIs. We chose not to do it before that because actually all the levels will improve significantly with the new factory, and we would rather come out with a, with a more challenging set of KPIs for the next three to five years. So at the next roadshow, sort of September, October time, we will come up with KPIs for the next three to five years and then continue to report on those. You know, obviously, the, uh, the social and governance aspects are equally important to, to investors. And here we also are very well positioned with our strategy and core business activities clearly aligned to the relevant UN Sustainable Development Goals. From a governance perspective, we are working to numerous um, ISO standards across our business. Uh, we achieve benchmark status here on the Isle of Man for the last two years, which is the highest level you can achieve and it's very much focused on continuous improvement. Um, our approach to sustainability comes from the top. So I actually sponsor all of the key initiatives inside the business um, with a dedicated team on the board level for, uh, uh, led by Richard Sales, our NED. And we're also committed to developing our people, diversity within our business. Currently, 60% of our employees are actually female, and obviously we provide equal rights for our shareholders. So moving to the outlook, if I may, um, this is, you know, for me, a really exciting and pivotal period for Strix. We have a really resilient business, which I hope you can see from the numbers, very strong, strong financial performance, and we have uh, everything we need to, to deliver you know, the growth that we've committed to in our five-year plan. Yeah, as a business, yeah, we've spent some time now building the foundations, and I believe we're very much structured for growth. We have a new factory that can double our capacity, the acquisition of Leica, um, a really strong, dedicated workforce and a you know, very, very strong roadmap of new products. As I mentioned before, you know, of course there are headwinds, but I feel that we're in a very strong position to be able to offset those. So certainly anything we can see at the moment, we are very comfortable that we can actually cover 
um, through either efficiencies internally or through uh, commercial energy or price increases in, into the marketplace. And we as a management team are very confident of both our 2021 commitments, but also on executing the medium term to deliver against those five year um, plans. And if we can move to the last slide, which I think is the investments. So I hope you agree, very fast run through, that we have a very compelling uh, investment proposition. We've delivered growth during the pandemic, whilst continuing to invest in the business, particularly in those strategic initiatives. We have a high quality, resilient and robust business that benefits from geographical and product diversification. And we're poised for growth with some very compelling opportunities and some really good growth markets as well. We have a solid balance sheet uh, and low leverage providing a strong financial flexibility to navigate any headwinds and to deploy capital consistent with the allocation of capital priorities. And we remain totally committed to an attractive um, progressive dividend policy that really does reflect the board's confidence in our outlook and the group going forward. So in summary, um, we are ready and well positioned to maximize our opportunities as we emerge from the pandemic and we intend to realize the full potential of this company during delivering that, that five year plan that was communicated in the Capital Markets Day. So with that, I'll stop talking and open up to questions. All right, thank you, Mark. Um, uh, very comprehensive uh, run through there of the, of the business as it is today. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to this kettle that can uh, boil itself whilst I shout through Alexa. That's quite a good idea. But I'd like you to produce one that produces a beer for me at half time as well, not rather than a coffee. But there you go. One day, one day. Um, right, we've got plenty of uh, plenty of questions here, so I'll just pick them off as they've been voted for. The first one says, um, "You mentioned that the revenue will grow circa 30% in FY 2021." Um, However, the earnings per share forecast for 2021 is only going up by about 8%. And um, could you comment on whether this is because margins and, and uh, return on capital are expected to be lower in 2021, uh, or uh, is there some other reason for this uh, particular gap, if you like? Um, yeah, I, mean, I think one of the things that we've been accused of many times before is being quite a conservative company. And, and I think in yeah, the Capital Markets Day, that certainly that, that has been the case. We're, we obviously want to put numbers out that we are going to deliver. Um, there are obviously some, some um, costs with the, with the acquisition still to go through in, in the first year. Um, there is a little bit of dilution in the early stages because you've got the water category coming on and we've got to do some work with um, Leica in particular to, to bring it more to, sort of, to the corporate reporting side. Um, but I think we'll see that done relatively quickly. Um, but I think the, the honest answer is that there is a degree of conservatism in those numbers. Okay. What uh, are you expecting? Uh, you know, I've noticed obviously the the the, uh, the the core kettle business, kettle control business, is uh, you know we we can see what the margin is for that over the years. It's fairly stable. But now you've got you've added on some fairly chunky bits that are going to grow faster and. By 2025, are going to constitute 60% of the business in revenue terms, I think, and the kettle controls business will be down to about 40, 45%. What do you expect to, to, to happen in terms of margins in those two businesses that you've acquired? Are they going to be similar to the same as kettle controls, or are we going to see slightly different margins there? Yeah, again, a really good question. So the kettle is clearly a very good margin business. Um, and I think if you look at the other two parts of the business, appliances and water, it's probably worth just touching on those separately. The appliances can, can be sort of in, in two forms. In some cases, we sell components to a brand and we support the brand in actually bringing those products to market. Those, are, those can be very, very high profitability, you know, similar to the kettle type of business. In other cases, we're selling the whole appliance. And whilst we get the, the very strong margin and profit for the, the components, yeah, the, the actual the whole appliance will dilute um, the, the, the margin percentage to a degree. It's still very profitable, but it will have a small dilution impact. So the ratio of own brand to um, your global brands, for instance, does have a slight impact and it's very difficult to actually project exactly what that's going to be over the period of time. Hence, again, we've been quite conservative in making sure that we can deliver what we said. Um, the water side of the business is quite interesting. I mean, so that is actually, as you can see from some of the numbers that are out there for Lyco, is, is, is a lower percentage uh, business, and it will actually be the fastest growth area. Again, still very profitable. But what you will see over time is as we get more of the appliances out in the marketplace, the actual filter sales will increase. 
um, and the filters are a much higher margin than the, the, the fridge jugs or some of those appliance bases. So you will actually start to see that ramp up and you know, the, the level of, of speed of that you know, still has to be, to, to, to be seen. Today we sell about eight filters to every fridge jug, for instance, that can go out there. Again, the more filters we sell to competitor appliances as well, will increase that margin. I think on the other side, there's something perhaps we have not um, factored into the numbers. Again, obviously we want to be very careful what numbers we put out there is the new factory and the benefits of the new factory. Some of the things that we, we do today, we've, we've had to buy, buy in because we just don't have the space in China today. As of August, we'll start insourcing a lot of those processes and we would expect to see somewhere between a six to 8% improvement in the margin in that filter part of the business over the next sort of one to three years as well. So you will start to see that, that water side not getting to the level of kettle. So there'll be still a small dilution overall, um, but certainly it will close the gap between the, between the two. Right, thank you. Yes, you, you touched on the factory there, and I think you said early, early in the presentation that was going to take a significant percentage of unit cost out of the kettle controls compared to today's level. I can't remember offhand what it was, about 15, 20 percent or maybe a bit more. Um, the, not, not, the, not the cost of, so the, the, new, the new factory is allowing us to, con, to, to increase the, the level of automation. Yeah. Um, we're bringing in new controls, which are much physically much smaller and therefore lower cost. I don't think I actually gave a percentage of the cost. We don't normally give that out. If I did, that was a mistake. <laughs> but no, it, it, it is a- Just trying it, to lead the witness, sir. I could try. So no, it, it is a significant reduction in cost. Um, so, so obviously that, that, that benefits the, the consumer and the OEMs. Um, but not only does it do that, it actually allows the OEMs to say, have some savings in how they actually build the kettles as well. So the overall savings is, is that much higher. And as I say, that can only really be done with very, very um, um, automated lines with, with a lot of technology. The tolerances in these controls is very, very tight. There's about a thousand critical dimensions we measure on every control that goes through our production line. And um, so whilst it's a very simple mechanical switch, actually to make them is, is really quite challenging. Okay, okay. Okay, I was, uh, I, I was just uh, keen to understand the margin movements here because you've got on the one hand a factory that's presumably going to take cost out of your core product. On the other hand, you were talking about price increases for the product. So, I'm, I'm as a as an investor, I'm looking for an increase in gross margin there. But uh, uh, I'll uh, we'll we'll see what happens. Um, I mean, the guidance we gave, just, just, just I'm, not, I'm not trying to hype things. So the guidance we gave, we gave even when we listed actually for the cattle control business was plus or minus two percent, depending on depending on geographical mix and and the sort of product mix that goes through. So if you're selling a lot more to China, obviously it's different to selling more in the regulated market. So you, you do see this plus or minus two percent swing. In truth, I think since we listed in 2017, we've never seen it go down. And again, even during the pandemic, we saw it go up. However, you know, during the pandemic, you know, we did take a lot of the variable costs out, so we, we responded very, very quickly. So probably there's one or two percent artificial in there because we took so much variable cost out, and we stopped producing on the on the manual lines because the volumes were different. So everything was going through the automated lines. So I still think that guidance of plus or minus two percent is is valid for the core cattle control business. Okay, thank you. Um, Question here on your IP and how well or badly it uh, it is in terms of defending it in China. Is that a particular problem, or is it is it you know sort of similar to how you defend it in the UK or any other country? You know, I, we must be an exception to the rule. I mean, we have a, a really good relationship with the, the China government. Uh, we were one of the first Western companies back in two thousand and ten to take action against some of the uh, copiers players, and we won those cases in the Beijing courts. Um, we have taken numerous actions all over the world since then, uh, in China and elsewhere. To be honest, we've got quite a reputation. So typically, when we take those actions, we don't actually end up going to court anymore. We tend to find we can settle outside of the courts. Um, yeah, if, if we don't settle, then we still continue down that path. And we've taken actions in China, uh, in America, uh, South Africa, Europe. Um, but I'll be very honest, the IP really is, is very important in the first three to five years of the, the, the product. After that, most of the actions we take are safety actions. So every year we will go and buy a large number of kettles in the shops, we'll test them in our laboratory, we'll fail them, and then we'll go to the local um, uh, test houses or governments and say that these products don't meet requirements and we'll get them removed from the shelves. And typically we can get about 50% of those removed from the shelves through safety actions. And I guess the other point to make is, is even when IP has expired, I mean, many of you remember the old immersed kettles with the sort of element you could see in the bottom of the kettle. Um, that's now expired for more than 11 years, but we actually took actions in 2019 um, using the copyright law for immersed kettles. So even then, you can still take actions to protect your technology. 
and we're, we're very uh, we're very diligent in doing that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, in in terms of your production capacity, um, where does it sit in each country? Uh, you mentioned China, you mentioned Italy, Isle of Man potentially, um, and uh, does that does that mean you're totally dependent on say certain products in one of those factories or have you have you spread your risk somewhat um so so if you look at the different areas i mean italy first of all is, is a filtration business so that's got a, a state-of-the-art um, automated filtration line um so we can produce filters in there and that's really all that one does as it stands today um if i look at the isle of man that is making very small um high value components um you know for kettle control business which are then shipped to china in truth we do have facilities to make those in china as well um, but we get tremendous support from the isle of man government here so it's actually uh, makes a lot of sense for us to keep that you know, here our head office is here as well also so yeah there is um, there is sort of safety if you like in being able to produce uh, most of those components in two parts um, in china that's primarily the assembly of the controls um, yeah and obviously we've, we've expanded the capacity of that because we were just completely full in that factory um, so that's dedicated to the assembly of the controls itself. Okay, so all of the controls are made in China and all the like are, uh, with the exception of a small component in the Ottoman, and then you've got the uh, Italy for all the Leica technology. Yeah, yeah we, okay. do have, we do have um, filtration lines in, in China as well for the Aquapla product, so we can actually produce filters in, in two of the sites. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Um, if um, Second question, if 14% of US households have kettles in 2021, what makes us think it'll grow now? I presume kettles have been around for years, so what's yeah. stopping it? And, and you know, most, most, most people are still using kettles, but the old stovetop ones, you know, sometimes still even with the whistles on, which is, is, is quite bizarre to think of, in fact. I mean, actually, there's been quite a transition in America over the last sort of five years. So... Obviously, um, yeah, America you know, was, um, and still to a degree, is a coffee drinking nation. Um, there's also the issue that they have 110 volt supply, so kettles take a little bit longer than they would here in the UK, where yeah, we're all used to that three kilowatt kettle. Um, however, yeah, what happened about five or six years ago now, um, you know, Starbucks bought Tivana, and even in the UK now, if you go to Starbucks, 50% yeah, of your menu is, is some form of tea, and the other 50% is coffee. Yeah, and the, the US has really started to have a boom in sort of um, different types of tea and then people are really understanding the health benefits of tea. So that really gets start moving people from you know, just being early adopters to the beginning of the mass market. And if you go to you know, one, of, one of the Walmart stores today in America, you're going to see you know, 20 to 30 kettles on the shelves, very similar to you see in one of the supermarkets here. If you go back sort of six, seven years ago, you've probably seen one or two if you were lucky. So there has been a big change, um, pretty much a double digit growth now. Whereas the regulated market generally is only growing at about two to three percent, so you're seeing a, you know, quite a significant increase. I mean, one thing I will say, I think some of the the new appliances we're bringing out, like the Aurora that I mentioned, just just due to come out, you may supersede the kettle because you know, the American houses have quite a lot of space and they do like to have you know all this functionality. It tends to become a bit of a showpiece in the in the kitchen, so we may see some of those appliances actually sort of um, leapfrog in the kettle. But that, that suits us. I mean, the, the value inside one of those plants is significantly higher than that of a, of a kettle and, and similar margins as well. Okay. But on a global level, just extending that question, where do you see the biggest growth rate in demand for kettle controls coming? Um, in terms of percentage growth, um, it's really sort of the, the ones I mentioned. I mean, you know, uh, America is, is close to double digit growth. You know, China, um, only 40% penetrated, runs between sort of eight and 12%. I mean, you do get, it's, it's hard getting accurate numbers out of, out of, right. of the territory. Um, the less regulated territories, you know, tend to be also somewhere around the double digit 10%. And um, at the moment, India is very, very strong. Um, you know, Russia is not actually growing in um, penetration, but we're growing that in, in share in that market as well. So it's a combination of, of those, those four, I would say are the largest markets that are showing growth, at least. There's a lot of small markets showing you know, significant growth. Places like Indonesia will be sort of more than 100% growth, but yeah, they're very small markets on their own. Right. Um, question here on competitors in each market. I think you touched on this briefly in terms of Kettle Controls, one of the old family companies that split away. And um, in Leica, it was Brita, wasn't it? There was the, the water filter and, and the like. Um, but could you just go a, a quick recap through those? And, and could you tell us, if anything, which ones you regard as the most um, 
shall I say, shall I say the ones that keep you most awake at night, if that's the right description? <laughs> yeah. So if we start with the kettles and say there's only one um, one competitor outside of China, uh, which came from that original family, uh, we're nearly four times the size of that particular business. Um, you know, so so for us that that's you you're always going to have a competitor, and, and actually for us it's 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 a, it's a good competitor to have. Um, you know, um, they, they, they keep us honest. They make sure that the the prices are are, are not sort of um, changing you know, too quickly. And yeah, you know, in these these days, you know, any brand or retailer is always going to want to have some sort of competitive offering. So there's always going to be a player like that in the market. So you know, I wouldn't say we lose particular sleep over them. Um, yeah, you know, but that's the only real competitor we have in in the regulated sectors. All of the others um, in less regulated China, in particular, are these these China copiers players. Um, you know, many of those are very very different to to our model. Um, a lot of them they're using sort of manual production lines, um, so they're going back to to much much higher cost models. They don't require the same margins, um, but they're very very typically very different in terms of materials being used and and quite often the quality of the products being used as well. So I, I'm not sure we lose any sleep. Well, I don't use any any sleep over over them. Um, you know, we have you know, a very very good cost base because of the automation that we put in place. Um, you're producing a control every 1.8 seconds on our, on our, on our factory line. Um, you know, we, we do have different controls for different markets as well, so we can make sure we've got the lowest cost products. So I don't particularly lose sleep on any of those, and the, the competitors aren't really changing in those markets. And I do think, as I mentioned, we're, we're trying to bring in technology to continue to drive that cost down, but also make it harder for those competitors to follow. I mean, the, the, the appliance side, you know, we have very differentiated technology. So you know, there are competitors, but we're working with all of the major brands and retailers. And um, you will see the Aurora launch with Aqua Optima, our own brand. And within three to four weeks, you'll see one of the global brands come out with that technology in their own appliance. So yeah, we work with, with those, you know, to, to maximize the number of units being sold. So no real competitors that would concern me in that appliance section at all. And on the filtration side, you have the one, the one big, big player, Britta, which you know, dominates the market by far. And then you've got five or six different players, which are strong in one or two individual markets, but not, not global players. You know, we're very strong in Italy and the UK, but yeah, with, our, with our roots now in China and also in America, we're looking to become a much more global player in that marketplace. Okay, thank you. Uh, speaking of keeping awake at night, another question on uh, what is the top item on your risk register? Um, yeah, we, we talk about this an awful lot um, in the business, and you know, they're, they're, not, they're not huge if I look at our risk register. I mean, the, the, um, yeah, the risk that we look at are probably things like the, the, uh, the raw materials, um, but you know, we can actually pass those through. So yes, they're a risk and they can, they can be disruptive, um, but yeah, they affect all of the players in the marketplace, so, so they're not particularly um, concerning. The one that always comes up when I'm asked, you know, do it, I'm, you know, where do I lose my sleep at night? It's a similar question you just asked. You know, if you look at doomsday scenario, you know, you know, some of those China players would take over the world. Um, today, we are taking actions against, against them on a constant basis. You know, most of them don't actually meet the, the international specifications. If they were to meet them, you know, we do have lower cost controls that we could bring into those marketplaces. So again, we would still be able to fight them on, on, a, different, on a different level with different controls. When you look at our controls, you know, they are, they are definitely priced differently for different markets. Um, and you know, depending on the power you have, does depend on the cost of that control. So that's why you won't see many copiers coming into the you know, places like the UK, because when you get to a three kilowatt appliance, they're much, much harder. The, the heating of those controls is much, much higher. Um, you need much more control over the conduction of heat. So you, you won't see many of those copiers play at that, that level at all. Okay, thank you. Um, question here on the, the revenue and profit split for the three divisions that you talked about now. Uh, do you have a long-term sort of share of revenue stroke profit for the three divisions in mind? Uh, you've touched on 2025 for revenue, but uh, just could you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, we haven't really put out um, um, the the overall um, profit numbers. I mean, there is some some guidance numbers in the capital markets day. Uh, I'll be very honest. I think they are they are they are really just guidance. And I think as I said at the beginning, yeah, we were accused on the capital markets day of being very conservative, and, and we are. And you know, I don't, I don't apologise for that. To be quite honest, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunities for us to improve that. Yeah, you know, I think where our margins are today, yes, as I said before, there will be some dilution, but like, yeah, we're we're looking at maybe five, five to six percentage points rather than some of the numbers we put in the capital markets day. Depending on all those mixes of appliances versus components, um, and how quickly we can bring the insourcing in for the water category as well. 
Okay, thank you. Um, you touched on SAP. Uh, you've got a new ERP system in place. Um, just a question here about what's the status on the SAP implementation and when will it complete? So, so the, the main SAP is, is complete. So you know, all of our numbers are run, will run at year end using the SAP system and we're running that as the only system we use now. So that, that's all in place. And we're looking to bolt on some additional parts. So we've got the, the CRM looking to be added this year, which is just to sort of further improve sort of the links you know, from the outside of the business. So that, that's all, as far as we're concerned, the, the key SAP module is, is all complete. Okay. And um, just on, uh, in terms of sales channels, is the question here about, do you sell through the direct to retailers or are you mostly going through OEMs? So for, for kettles, we tend to sell, it's a really good point. We tend to sell directly to the OEM. So we sell the control to the OEM who makes the kettle. Uh, we have a lot of value there. So we, we design kettles. We do about a third of the kettles around the world in terms of the industrial design. We design heating elements. We even actually take those kettles from the OEMs and sell them to the contacts we have, which is 450 brands and retailers. So whilst we, we make our money by selling the control primarily to the China-based OEMs, we actually you know, work very closely with their customers to maximize the sale of controls going, you know, going forward after that. So you right. really work across the value chain. Okay. Uh, one investor here is concerned to some degree about the strategic weakness of focusing so much on the kettle market um are there any other product areas that you're looking into for further expansion yeah it's, it's a good point so that you know the kettle market obviously has been at our roots yeah we do do some work in sort of the coffee areas and i think you'll see as appliance come you'll sort of see a bit more diversification in some of the, the beverage type areas that we're going to go into um certainly the the aurora product did starts that process off um one thing we haven't touched on at all at the moment is the five-year plan is is all organic growth yeah, clearly we're still going to look for acquisitions, but they will be around sort of different technologies, primarily in the small domestic appliances or the filtration business, so certainly our core competencies. Um, and we are only looking at acquisitions that would be, um, we, we certainly wouldn't let our, our, our debt ratio go above the two times. But I think we've proven we can pay that down very quickly. We're very comfortable there, um, but we continue to seek those. We didn't put them in the numbers because you're finding the right one that doesn't you know, cause too much dilution of our business, obviously is very hard. They're out there. Um, but yeah, we'll, we will continue to look for those and they will be incremental to the plans that we've got at the moment. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, I've got one final question. I know we're slightly over, but uh, I'll ask it anyway, because I think it's a quick one. If you're aiming for number two in water filtration, which I thought you mentioned earlier, you were already, but if you're not, uh, where are you now? Yeah, that's a really, there, there is really no number two player, actually. There's, there's five or six people, you know, including ourselves, that sort of are vying for that position, but there's no clear number two player in the market. I mean, oh, right, okay. One in one or two markets, but not globally. So for us, yeah, we're, we're sort of in that second tier at the moment, and we want to make sure we sort of leapfrog that and become clear number two. Okay, thank you. Great. Well, well, that covers all the questions. So thank you for ask, answering them very succinctly there. And uh, we're a couple of minutes over, so we won't keep you any longer other than to thank you for joining us today and uh, explaining a lot more about Strix. So I know a hell of a lot more now about kettle controls than I ever did before. And uh, thank you very much. I hope we'll uh, hear more from you as, uh, as things develop. I wish you well with your startup in China as well. And I uh, hope things go well in, and you, uh, you, you're up and running in August as predicted. Thank you very much. I appreciate everyone's time. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Mark.